Hello everyone, uh, welcome to our fifth webinar in our series, Beyond the Possible, um, where we'll be exploring different takes on nature, climate and soil friendly farming and land use. Um, just a quick reminder for tonight that the chat function is disabled, but we'll have time with the Q&A um, after the talk. Um, so if you think of questions at any point, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box and we'll answer them at the end. So our speaker tonight is Mark Dickinson. Uh, this is a man of uh, many talents, uh, from surfing to poetry to ecology. Um, but most relevant for tonight's topic is that he is an enterprising veganic crofter. Um, so he lives on the island of Westry in Orkney, and he has a croft called Forncroft. Um, so I had the pleasure of visiting Mark back in September. Um, and it was amazing to see the massive variety of crops and different perennial species he's growing. Um, in a such a haven for wildlife and biodiversity. Uh, and despite being in such a northerly location, um, there's uh, quite a few exotic crops growing there. Uh, I had the pleasure of tasting some great cherry tomatoes. There was several varieties of chilies and even lemons as well, which was amazing. Um, and then one thing I really remember was uh, first seeing his farm. Uh, you can really, it really stands out from a distance. Uh, the Arcadian landscape is quite heavily dominated by uh, beef cattle and, and livestock, so you can see his right away with the dense, dense shelter belts uh, towering over the landscape. Um, so without further ado, I'll let Mark unmute himself. Uh, you can share your screen and uh, we'll get started. Hello. Um, I, um, thanks everyone for uh, coming and thanks to Sam uh, and Rebecca for having me. Um, uh, we'll start with the first slide, which should have the pictures of the croft on it. Uh, the, uh, yeah, with the, the pictures missing. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll just go on from there. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so the the uh, for me, uh, how I uh, see everything is that I predominantly am uh, heavily inspired by nature farming um, and natural farming. Um, so. I have, there's no definitive rules that I follow. There's only uh, natural values. Everything to me is ethically driven. Um, so weeds, insects, birds, animals are all assets. Um, I, uh, um, I, we don't compost here and we don't uh, find it, it it's, it's a necessary thing. Um, we don't use a lot of, uh, we don't have big machinery. So moving it around is uh, very problematic. Um, and we practice minimal um, soil disturbance. Um, it's uh, key to everything that we do is um, creating diversity, looking after our soils, um, and it's it's always habitat um, that comes first. Uh, I see a, a human beings as implicitly a part uh, a part of the natural system. Um, so um, humans our nature um, and we're, we're not separate from it. Um, so it's, we're integrated into it just like unnecessary plants, insects, birds, animals. Um, uh, can you put the next slide on please? Um, so basically I, I build a map of when I come to an area of land, I, I have useful, uh, useful resources. Um, this one's the National Soil Map of Scotland. Um, so the, in, in natural farming or nature farming, you would usually, observation of the land would be key to how you um, come to relate to the land, how you, you could work the soils, how you could come to, you, you need to understand it implicitly. Uh, 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 there's no way of getting around that, but by using utilizing all of these resources that we have available to us, we can learn so much about the, uh, 
the landscape that we're a part of um, or the land that we own um, from um, all of this, uh, all of these tools. Um, so this one is the National Soil Map of Scotland. It, it'll give you a breakdown of what your soil types are. So there's alluvial soils there, brown soils. Um, I'll, I, I, I mostly work with calcareous soils and um, mineral glaze. Um, I have my own theory about mineral glaze, which is that mineral glaze used to be at one point, I think they were always shallow peat soils, but over time, because of industrial agriculture, um, they got incorporated into the into the um, boulder clay, um, and then with the boulder clay being a, quite a calcareous um, mix, it, it changes the um, acidity um, and changes the constituency of the actual soils. So um, yeah, they're an interesting soil to work with mineral glaze. From this, you also get the land capability for agriculture, what these soils allegedly can produce, and the land capability for forestry, which is also important in the way that um, uh, forestry is an integral part. Where, where um, in because I would say that I always look at certain um, elements of land as as being desertified, and even though they're green and they're, there's there's a certain element of desertification that takes place. There's there's um, uh, a denuded landscape um, amongst um, monocultures of grasses. So in normal nature farming and natural farming, you'd be coming to a landscape that was already um, more dynamic. It would, it would, it would be um, already full of beauty. Uh, uh, the, to a certain extent, some of the land that you're taking on would, in more marginalised areas would be already heavily desertified in a different way to how we understand the, the uh, dry deserts these are wet deserts um so the first start is to start putting things back um can we have the next slide please so the so the next tool that i use the forestry research support tool this is an absolutely fantastic tool this will give you soil moisture regimes this is specific to your location so wherever you're located anywhere in scotland you can find out what soil types you've got it, it's, it's you can go out into the land and you can learn all of this you can learn there'll, there'll always be topographical differences but it's so good to just have this um a, a, as as a, a as a resource um i, I can't emphasize it enough so this will give you your you, you soil moisture regime so you know that when you're starting out that you may have problems with it either being incredibly wet or incredibly dry um it'll give you your temperatures um your exposure which is really important how exposed are you here where uh, they, they use a a thing called the um dams classification that was actually created from uh, a gentleman in Orkney in the um, early part of the 20th century I think um, and he used tatter flags and that's how quickly the uh, fabric that's torn tears and that gives you tells you how strong and then exposed it is to the wind so exposure is really good so as I say we're 17 here which is already quite a high rate of exposure but when you also give them the latitude that we're on um, it really gives an example that really we're growing in a mountainous area. Even though it's very low lying, um, your climate is much closer to being um, uh, uh, mountainous. Uh, a lot of research that's been done in, in some of these Northern Isles uh, associates that it's, it's a meeting place between coastal plants and alpine plants. It's one of the only places it actually happens. Um, so there we have the dams and exposure to winds. It gives you your soil nutrient regimes um, from very poor, um, to very rich um, and carbonate, so that's that's telling you how much uh, nutrition is available in your soil before you even start, which is a fantastic thing to know. And this can tell you on on um, what you need to start applying, whether you need to start creating more porosity in the soil, whether you need to enrich the soils. Um, sometimes, if you're starting off with medium-based soils that are, um, have a medium nutrient regime, there's very little you have to do. You, you, you've, you've, you've already got such a great start. Um, if you've got peat soils, you, you, everybody goes out and buys large quantities of peat. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an excellent soil. Um, so you're very fortunate if you've got peat soils. Um, the ecological site classification would tell you, in this instance for the forestry research uh, support tool, it's telling you what um, uh, forest trees you could grow there in relation to your site. But that will also tell you what plants you could grow there um, 
uh, over time. Um, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an excellent, another really good resource. I, I, uh, uh, right tree, right place, the way that the RSPB are seeing it is, is in a slightly different sense. So this is the way that we can see that if you look at mineral soils in terms of carbon sequestration, um, you can see that, that, that mineral soils are some of the best soils to sequester carbon in. The, the, this, this is a, I recommend going to see this, the RSPB carbon map. If you're ever doing anything in relation to reforestry or you're interested in carbon sequestering in any kind of format, or, um, um, it's, it's, a, it's another really good tool. Um, um, and the, if you utilize this tool, you could, they were looking to maximize the benefits of, of food production, carbon and well-being, which is that kind of inclusivity that, um, you know, which I'm very much um, passionate about. Um, connective recovery, what a beautiful um, phrase. Um, uh, and nature rich solutions, which is um, entirely what, if you're doing anything nature farming based or you're ecologically or veganics, which would be different to plant based. Um, farming models, veganic models are very much ethically enriched. So nature rich solutions are very much a part of um, what, what, what you'd be creating and what you'd be involved with, I imagine. Um, next slide, please. Um, so another, another great resource is WeatherSpark. This gives you growing seasons. Um, how long um, is your growing season? It gives you start dates and end dates on average and historically. So you've got, uh, it, before you even start keeping diaries about planting or anything like that, you've got these resources already available. It's already mapped out. So much work has, uh, has been done. Um, it gives you your growing degree years. Your short, short wave solar energy is so important if you're citing polytunnels. It, it's, it's such a um, fantastic thing and, sh and shows you, as is wind direction, especially in terms of percentages in, in how you're going to orientate your, your polytunnels. All of these tools are available um, to you. This one's off um, this uh, page is, is from Stornoway. So um, rainfall, cloud cover averages. So you, you get a really, with all of these resources, you'll have an incredible picture before you even start of what you're getting involved in, what you're getting into, and what you need to do to achieve the results that you're after, whether you're growing veganically, um, bio-intensively, um, um, or in a nature farming model. Um, or even in terms of uh, forestry or agroforestry. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is um, the site that I uh, that we work on at, at, at Tom. This is um, at, at my home. Um, um, these you can see on the uh, picture here. You've got the shelter belts that go around. Um, we have uh, willows to the front there, um, and. Uh, in, in this place, these are what I call lazy beds. Um, these are, are raised ground. They have pathways in between. Um, it's all chop and drop mulch um, in all of the things that we do. There's also, we collect the straw and grasses and we'll put those um, down the pathways. Um, it's always under continual cover. Um, as I say, we don't compost. Um, if, you, if we're stripping anything off, we'll strip it there. Like if you're taking cabbages out we leave the roots in the ground um, take the leaves off the cabbages that we're not going to use they all go back onto the ground rabbits are in there hedgehogs are in there um, a huge array of um, nesting birds are in there um, lots of um, various different insects all super important um, um, uh, animals are so important um, they bring us phosphorus they bring us loads of different types of minerals in their in the waste produce in the waste product um, we work on a heavy cut so from all of the resources that i've just told you about um that that gives me a picture before i even knew about any of these soils that's already it, it can tell me every single one of these um descriptions that i've given you so we have a heavy clay soil um i told you before that we were it, this is the one i mentioned it's a mineral glare it's very moist in 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 winter it becomes it has lots of standing water, which is why it's so important for us to have the raised beds. Um, it's classed as a soil class 4.2, land capable of producing a narrow range of crops. 
in the picture there, there's French bean growing, pea, um, pumpkin, um, courgette, um, onions, cabbages, um, asparagus, strawberries. Um, so we can actually grow a, an incredible range of crops. Um, the site class is considered cool. It's highly exposed and it's moist. The moisture is good to know uh, about because that means that really I don't need any irrigation. So I don't use any irrigation at all in these kind of soils. It's it's um, I don't find it's necessary. Um, even in we have incredibly dry years, it's not really a problem. They they. Um, it can be a little bit problem when you when you're establishing some plants, but once they get the roots down deep into the ground, there's so much diversity in there that um, they'll they'll pull the moisture from deep within because that's what clay soil is really good at. On these kind of soils, I would never dress them with kelp or anything like that because the problem because it's so cool, um, it's it's you need to raise the temperatures of your soil. So. Um, uh, kelp's never uh, it's not a good thing at doing that it, it's uh, and it's not particularly that conducive to clay soils either in its structure um this ground isn't suitable for forestry um but in with forestry um or rather with agroforestry the way that we do it with shelter belts um i don't work in terms of what would be native in terms of um British native, I work in bioclines, imagine a big lateral line going all the way around the globe and then all the dates. So our nearest climate to to as far north as we are would be somewhere like Unalaska, um, um, maybe so uh, higher up than Nova Scotia. Um, it, um, so I'm looking for, a, I look for the native willows. I also use paleonology, um, which is pollen samples. Um, a form of archaeology um, which tells me about the the habitat that used to be there 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago. Um, these would be Salix cinerea, um, Salix phylicifolia, um, but also on my bioclime would be a lot of the Alaskan varieties which would be in the picture there you can see uh, Salix hookeriana, um, Salix alexensis is another one. These are in uh, quick growing, uh, thick branching, and they create brilliant um, shelter very, very quickly. Two to three years, you've got incredible amount of shelter um, and, and good stem growth. In the sh uh, uh, in between these rows, I'd, I'd, I'd also put in natives like birch and alder, which are all around these hedging. Um, to the back of there, as it goes further down, there's another hectare of woodland, and then there's another two hectares to the other side, um, which are also, my version of a northern fruit forest although that's a, a difficult term this far north um so yeah um next slide please um so i look at these site constraints um exposure we've talked about heavy soil which has got poor workability that's 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 a problem in my establishment um compaction poor drainage, all of these are uh, tied together. Slow to warm up, we've already talked about that. Um, short seasonality and oceanicity. Um, when you look at those, you wonder why you even bother. But once you get to the other side, um, with the shelter belts, alleyway cropping um, between, not only using trees for alleyway cropping, but also using grains for alleyway cropping, um, which I call shield buffer strips. A lot of buffer strips are often used around the edges of fields, but I use buffer strips in the um, the beds, um, which will shield um, crops uh, that are more sensitive um, from wind. Um, they're also great at the, the, they'll feed a, 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 a lot of the birds. They'll bring those in, which will bring their... Uh, fertilizer for me and I also use fleeces uh, as I talked about the lazy uh, the lazy beds or raised beds will take care of the workability they'll also take care of the compaction and the poor drainage um, recycle silage tap so I get recycled uh, plastic um, which is also recyclable I'll talk about that later how we use that as um, um, protection to protect the soils um, and to make them workable earlier in the season really important for heating up um, the soils here and also um, the 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 great at creating shelter and a beautiful temperature for the propagation of worms and um, 
micro and macro fauna, um, which is important for your soils. Um, compostable mulch sheeting. Um, uh, we use that sometimes. Um, that depends on the problem of weeds because we don't weed that much. It's, I don't find weeding that's mo uh, that important. But if we do weed, the grass clipping straw and weeds all go down on the bed. Um, I don't take them away, um, I just drop them. Um, insects, mam mammals and bird droppings, um, they're also part of um, uh, solving problems with drainage. Birds are great at that, at, at creating good tilth. Um, they're also great at working through compaction, um, especially um, birds like oyster catcher. Um, but blackbirds are also incredible at, at doing stuff like that. So is curlew, another great bird. Um, it's a great one to work alongside and really that's really what you're doing and i suppose they're your machines that's the technology that you we're all networked in together um so the next slide please uh, next one again please uh so for some reason the pictures aren't coming up of the of, of the backgrounds but um i guess it's just because it's the background picture so we'll have to go on to the next slide um, this shows the, the, there was a better picture there of them in the, uh, so you've missed that picture, unfortunately. Uh, there's nothing I can do about that. But this shows the wind shield, uh, uh, the buffer strips um, in, in October. Um, so it allows us to grow outside. It, it's not, I suppose if you're way down south, this isn't a particularly uh, big deal that you can grow pumpkin. Um, but the, these, these, Buffer strips, this, this, where these pumpkins have grown would have previously been a buffer strip for another crop. Then that, that, that buffer strip there of um, whether it's um, barley or oats that were growing, the birds will come in, they'll clean off all the seed, um, they'll feed on it, then they'll uh, put all the droppings down, then we'll go through it with a, a mulching mower, just a mower, that's all we'll use, and then that'll chop it down. Then we'll plant directly into that with something like pumpkin, and then we'll shield it either side. Um, just to protect it from the wind, and and it means that we can get pumpkins out. We that that bed's about eighteen meters long. It'll probably produce about twenty to thirty pumpkins, um, and those pumpkins will be ripe in October. You'll have to bring them in, um, but you don't need to give up polytunnel space for pumpkins. I suppose that's all it's saying. And um, you know what what you can actually achieve outdoors um, this far north, because obviously, I think our highest temperatures. In the summer months are around 16 degrees um, and we're sort of averaging between 12 to 14 degrees but they don't really get up much beyond 16 degrees um, so a lot of these crops could be considered problematic this north um, so this is uh, next uh, slide please so this is just an example of shelter belts why we use shelter belts i mean uh, they give you um, uh, shelter for up to 20 times um, their height. Um, so if they're two meters, you can they get up to two meters within two to three years. So this isn't a big a big thing that that um, it's going to take years and you're not going to see any um, results. This is something that you can do in year one and you'll start to see results in year two to year and you'll see incredible results by year three depending on what um, varieties you use. Um, but it's good to get your shelter belts up to around six meters in um, width. Unfortunately, if you're on subsidies, you will you'll lose some of your subsidies from the width of your your shelter. But uh, nothing you can do about that. Um, so these are the benefits of shelter. If you go on to the next slide, please. Um, so up to 20 percent reduction in wind speeds for around 20 times the height. I've, I've, I've already mentioned that. It reduces soil compaction. Um, you, you can't underestimate the beneficial microclimate. I mean, it's incredibly huge in, in, a, in a climate where it's only getting to around 16 degrees anyway. It can be pleasant, if not warm, um, within the shelter of the um, shelter belts. Uh, it can feel around 20 to 22 degrees to, to the human skin. So you can imagine what it can do for plants. Um, it increases soil temperature, uh, increased humidity, which is so important in a coastal environment where you've got high salinity, 
um, and you've got the desiccation of the wind. Um, all of the time it dries rapidly, it's drying rapidly, which you, which you see in leaf cells. You can see them um, uh, through wind desiccation and through that drying that takes a place that looks very similar to um, uh, frost damage uh, to the leaf structure. And some plants can get around it through closing their stomata, shell, uh, stomata cells, but um, a lot can. So um, it's really important to increase humidity. Um, obviously, it attracts all of your beneficial insects, your pollinators, and, and becomes, we've talked about the uh, uh, birds and a micro management. They become a micro, they become part of your management team. Um, uh, and then the 20% average yield increase, I would say you could, it could even be higher than that because it increases the quality of the vegetable production and because of all of the shelter, um, it, 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 it's, it's increasing um, the diversity that you can, you, you can grow. And as I say, it's not just the shelter that you're growing around in a perimeter, it's also the shelter that you're using inside. Um, companion planting, I suppose, in a different way. You can use broad beans or an incredible great um, uh, uh, use for as a shelter belt um, um so there's pumpkin growing in the shelter belt the shelter belt that you can see there is three years old and it's only two and a half meters tall um but the the difference it's make as you can see the difference it's making to the pumpkins i mean they're quite happy there the french bean is there so, sorry yeah next slide um, have I said that? Yes, yeah, so, sorry. Um, so yeah, there you can see the, the pumpkins. Uh, you can see the, so they, the trees are two to, uh, about two to two and a half meters tall. Um, you've this French beans on the um, right hand side. Um, asparagus is next to it. It's under netting to protect it from the, the rabbits. The, so if I ever want to protect anything from something, um, because they're I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm quite greedy, so I want a, a quite a large percentage of, of the crop and sometimes rabbits get a bit carried away and they want a large percentage of the crop. So if I don't want them to take the large percentage of the crop, um, they can have as, a lot of the kale and um, that's, that, that's fine. They, they end up making that quite bushy for me. But they're also great, at, um, their natural instinct is to create clearing. So they're also very good at creating multiple branches um, from um for trees um i know they can be a problem in um by debarking but you know they, they bring a lot of advantages too um just to the side of that on the picture on the right hand side you can see just on the other side of the net there where the asparagus is you can just see some brown um that's kale so what we do with kale is it, it'll, it'll grow and we'll harvest it for about a year um it will we'll harvest it from around august time august august september and then we'll continue to harvest it through till around april may um and then we'll let it go to flower so it brings in all of the pollinators coming they love it there's nothing around in sort of like may time when it's so prolific with all of its beautiful flowers um then we'll let it go to seed and then all the birds will come in and they'll all eat the seed and then the and it'll also create as a shelter belt for that year. So that bed will be out for that year. That'll become a new buffer strip. Um, and then it'll just get mowed down, mulched in, and then we'll just go and plant straight back in it again. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's some courgette and marrow growing inside a shelter belt. Um, you can see a marrow in that picture there. So that grows outside. That's a great plant, very robust. Um, and you can grow different varieties. Some, we've, in, in relation to varieties, um, sometimes it's the F1 varieties, which uh, you know they're they're only um, uh, a land strain um, crossed with um, uh, a, a more uh, oh, I can't think of the word, um, but we use F1 and we use um, land race strains uh, too. So. Um, we trial off what we have is a in all the uh, plants that we produce, all the different crops that we produce, we have a benchmark plant, uh, and then it's the job of any other ones that we trial to 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 outcompete that one in terms of yield. Uh, yield's quite important in our models. Um, I want to see how successful these these things can actually be, and and what what can actually be achieved. Roughly, I say that. Uh, an 18 meter by 11 meter space is creating approximately 
250 kilo, depending on what it's growing, um, up to 500 kilo, um, so half a ton. So you're looking at two, two to four ton from that space. And also work is in really important because it's also about the calories that I'm putting in, not just the calorie, calorific value of the vegetables that have been produced, but also the amount that, 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 that we're putting in. So to run a space of that size with those four beds, it's probably roughly about 14 hours um, to produce around two ton, something like that. Um, that's also quite important to 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 see how much because you, and that's why it's, it's not that important to weed or anything like that. You can get carried away with spending far too much time on things that aren't really that important. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. So this is another site that I work on. So in this site here, this is this is twenty meters by twenty meters. Uh, space and including the space that's in the tunnels there there's roughly around in peak season around 12 hours to 14 hours work going into this this area here so um this this is a a, a light sandy soil um uh, calcareous soil um so it's it, it's fresh um which it's it means it's 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 quite dry. Um, it's 5.2, so it's land capable of use as improved grassland. So it's not really suitable for growing crops, apparently. Um, so um, the site class is cool again, highly exposed, um, and the nutrient status is medium. Um, so obviously, you can see there's quite a large range of crops growing there. You can see courgette in the in the um, third row in, um, working from the left. Um, uh, this is all straw mulch that goes down. You can see the weeds growing in the path. Sometimes they'll be cleared out if they get really big. Some of them are really beneficial because they'll tap down into deep pockets of minerals and they'll draw those up to the ground. So a lot of them are just left. Um, you'll spend more time. You can spend so much time weeding. It's and there's just no point. It's it's uh, and if we do any of that, it, we we just mulch it. Um, so you can see that there. It's not always the case that just because you've got really big green plants that you create a lot of nutrition from it. I've noticed that a lot of plants that are under stress create a lot more terpenes, um, which is where you get your flavors from, your 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 your, your tastes, your smells. Um, these are all the compounds that are, are created from from plants. So you don't need big green. A lot of uh, to to uh, with courgette, these these courgettes, although they don't look as robust as some, especially on heavier soils, they still produce great numbers of courgettes and far too many marrows for the end of the season. For seen as marrows, not particularly the favourite uh, amongst most people. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we've talked about constraints and remedies on the other site. Um, they're all similar um, and. That's how we, we've, I mentioned chop and drop. Um, it's a really important part of everything that we do. Grass clippings are really easy to get hold of. Obviously, um, we don't want to bring anything in, um, in terms of uh, uh, dressing the soil, in terms of uh, fertilizers or anything. It's, it's all takes care of itself. Um, and that's how we run it. And it's always continually covered. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there's a picture um, that you can see of the the same site with all of the beds up and running. Um, you can see there that there's um, uh, that mulch sheeting that's down in the middle there. That's biodegradable mulch sheeting. I've got a love and hate relationship with it in terms of that. It, uh, I think if everybody was to use it, um, I noticed Canada at the minute now have stopped it from being organic um, because there is a small amount of petro um, it, it, um, it's a, there's a small amount of of its components that are taken from um, petroleum synthesized from petroleum um, so but previously most organic farmers were using this um, you still can use it in the UK and um, we tend to not use it as a uh, that much anymore um, but it is great for warming up soils and it's great when you've got a problematic bed where you've got lots of chickweed seed in it or something like that because then the sheet can go straight over the top of it and it'll just mulch all of those chickweeds straight in so you've got a huge bed of nutrition for stuff to go straight um, in um, 
and also on these sandy soils, it's great to stop evaporation. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So protecting and enhancing um, the soil. Um, so adding organic matter, which we've talked about how we do that. So we want to, so we're increasing megaflora, um, earthworms, beetles, and microfauna, uh, bacteria, fungi, protozoa, that's so important. So basically the soil is just like a big giant living body. It wants tons of food. Because you're taking so much food out all the time continuously for yourself um, or for sale or for whatever you're doing, um, that's where it's getting starved. So it's so important that you work really hard to feed it. Um, and it's quite happy to feed on quite big um, meals. Um, doesn't have to all be chopped up into tiny little bits. Um, you might have to clear it to the side of your paths when you go to sow into it. Um, but you can work on that in your own methodology. Um, and that's part of the fun. Um, so we're just increasing soil fertility and we're incre increasing this the soil's resilience which is really important now in as the climate's becoming more problematic and unpredictable um, and it's a great thing because you create a really good um, fertile rich balanced soil that's full of its capacity to buffer ph isn't such a problem you 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 know you're always people are always meddling with ph looking at more alkalinity looking you know to to increase uh, decrease acidity um but the soil can buffer itself and it can build fertility over time um and that can bring you know incredible results so that you you don't have to worry about npk micro um Minerals, uh, in, 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 these are things that you, you don't need to know lots about. Uh, the, the soil takes care of itself once it's given a good, healthy meal. Um, so next slide, please. So this is the way that we, we protect our soils. Um, so the green strips that you can see on the, in the photo on the right hand side, they're all um, cover crops that were sown in September. Obviously, it's so difficult in this climate because basically by September, it's raining the temperatures are down to around 10 to 12 degrees um nighttime temperatures are down to like six degrees seven degrees um so there's not much potential for growth um but you can still do it so you can see these are all greening up they're, they're quite happy there these beds here this is the the this is recycled plastic and it's also recyclable um we use that to create a perfect environment for all of our microorganisms and um, macro flora. Um, and it will also, under there is um, loads of mulched beds. These plants have already come out. There's been chop and drop over it. That plastic sheeting will now heat it up and the earthworms and everything have got a really good habitat to get really prolific under. Um, um, it, it works best in a climate like this where you're continually and this is one a really good way of starting your beds as well if you haven't got large machinery because we have no tractors so basically you put these sheets down and we can start building beds um, and then just use mowers to mulch everything and incorporate things in if we need to um, and then we just light tillage here and there just really to, to perform a tilth um, which I've already said blackbirds are incredibly good at doing um, uh, next slide please um so just moving quickly i just wanted to talk about polytunnel production so there's three photographs here i, I do three different types of polytunnel um production um and compare and contrast i i, I find that fascinating um so i do um biointensive what i would call biointensive anywhere um a more veganic based model um and um, hydroponics, um, which I, I, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute anyway. So hydroponics and um, bioponics, which I'll also talk about in a minute. So next slide, please. So these are the three ways that I do artificial environments, I call them. So artificial environments are usually problematic, one, because they're artificial. Um, so they don't really follow, I wouldn't consider them to follow any kind of natural, um, they're, they're not really a natural system, but, um, which is why hydroponics fits into them. Um, uh, so the biointensive is the first one that we'll look at. I'll then quickly have a look at hydroponics and bioponics. Um, I'm fascinated by bioponics, which is you know got a lot of potential for vegan growers in the future on, in in uh, high tunnel production because of course hydroponics wouldn't be vegan. You could call it plant based. 
you can't really call it a plant-based production it's 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 ethically problematic um vegan organic co-cultivation is obviously one of the most aesthetically pleasing um to me um but you might see that from the photos um so next slide please so biointensive um pros and cons um so it's organic it's high yielding it got consistent results low input minimal tillage low cost highly sustainable um all good traits um the cons are artificial environment um, so it can't be regulated like your outdoor spaces. You haven't got the bird life coming in. You haven't got uh, the same dynamics with um, the micro and macro fauna. Um, so you, 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 you're going to have a boom bust. Um, not only with your insect colonies, but it, it can be uh, more problematic in, in, in terms of your quality of produce as well um, that you're creating out of it um, there's a limited control over extreme environmental factors because it's all under plastic in some form um, so airflow humidity heat all become problematic um, your season can only be extended with limited crops um, kales and lettuces and you can grow a lot of greens outdoors so to a certain extent the 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 tunnels have a limitation in done in a biointensive model. Um, so that's that's how I would do it. That's how, that's one of our biointensive tomato production, straw down the paths, three different things there. So this this yields oh, extraordinary amounts of tomatoes. I, I tend not to bother with cordons in, in these tunnels. Um, cordon varieties don't produce as much really in these tunnels because it's all based upon height. Um, um, so bush varieties are great, especially if you take on certain types of bush varieties, they can still be staggered over large periods of time. And some of them have, have incredibly thick skins, which can be really good for, um, it's not good for sale production though. Um, so if you are producing purely for um, selling, it's the thinner skins and the, um, the more aesthetically uniform um cordon varieties is a, 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 a probably a better option but the huge yields in here and very little work in a tunnel that size i would expect to do no more than an hour a week um this tunnel's four meters wide by 10 meters long so there'd be about an hour a week in that um and i don't need any irrigation in there because it's a mineral glaze soil um these are all under mulch sheets and on um uh, straw and all working on chop and drop and i'll put nothing in there um it'll then be top dressed um using grass clippings straw um leaf matter and it'll go into another rotation with probably uh, legumes that'll be incorporated back into it and then tomato may follow again um so this is hydroponic bioponics so the difference really between hydroponics and bioponics hydroponics is growing in you may know this anyway so but hydroponics is just growing in its water it's soilless so as i've said i, I, I wouldn't consider it vegan bioponics could well be uh, uh, it, it, it's it's it, it, bioponics has got a great future it's uh, uh, especially for um closed systems that's how i consider polytunnels and if they are going to ever be a sustainable system um closed systems are the best ones uh, because then you can regulate um co2 you can um, and co2 would be so important because then you don't need any pest control because you can just raise the co2 um so bioponics is basically uh, an organic hydroponic system so it would take it would use the same methods taken from nature um, and use those in a uh, to increase yield and enrichment um, can you go back to the other slide please sorry uh, that one yeah um, so yeah so the pros of the hydroponic high yields inert substrate so you've got no soil pathogens so um, and you can reuse a lot of the substrates as well um, so you don't need to be uh, supplying them uh, you don't need to be changing them yearly they're quite cheap to ship um, you've got consistent results, you've got minimal um, physical input, um, clean produce at the end of it. Um, if you've got the, the, you can control the environment ent entirely. So as an example, one of the um, 
big hydroponic um, ventures in Texas, which is a 30 year return. This is how much uh, they are in terms of um, capital expenditure. Um, uh, hit, hit yields of around, I think it was 98 kilo on average plants over a 10 hectare site, which is absolutely huge. That was on tomato production. Um, so that's why it's sustainable with a question mark. Um, certainly can be considered, like I've said, plant-based, um, certainly couldn't be considered vegan. There's nothing vegan about hydroponic growing. Um, so the cons of it is it relies off on off-farm inputs, e.g. Um, agro-minerals, but that wouldn't be the case with bioponics. Bioponics, technically speaking, you could take grass, you could take leaf litter, and you could instantaneously turn that into organic matter, which you could then feed directly to your plants. It's, it's a mixture between hydroponics and um, uh, veganics. Um, so yeah, it's a fascinating new world that's, that's starting to appear, bioponics. I've experimented with it, and there is pictures of it um, with, with growth. Um, on, on the next slide. So it's, it's got a huge initial investment and high maintenance costs. Um, uh, as I've said, stock free and plant based, but I wouldn't consider it vegan from the hydroponic perspective, but the bioponics can be, but it's re entirely reliant on large scale market forces. So all of the equipment is based upon cap capitalist systems. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so Oh, you can't see the hydro, uh, the pictures gone. Yes, yeah, so the next slide. So there you can see the, um, that actually there is a um, uh, bioponics, um, that one there with the tomatoes growing in those rows. You can see the cucumbers and the tomatoes um, that are, are now clean um, and uniform, everything is. Um, next slide, please. Um, so vegan organic um, co-cultivation, um, pros and cons, um, uh, low input, um, zero tillage. It's very similar to bio-intensive. Um, companion planting, which is how I do it. I do companion planting in co-cultivation. It's diverse. Um, you get a nice mixed harvest. I think it's a great thing for more personal production um, than it is for... Um, I think bio-intensive is better for capital-based production because uh, you need more of one crop um, than you do in personal production where you need more diversity um, but that would be on your own preferences um, so the the problems are, are the same as the biointensive um, yields you wouldn't uh, in a vegan or organic co-cultivation system I wouldn't I wouldn't think yield would need to be a factor um, um, and you've, you've got the same problem with the potential buildup of soil pathogens, which can be problematic, but you are trying to offset that with companion planting. Although companion planting can bring as many problems as it uh, solves it, but it's really an aesthetic thing, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, it's very pretty. Um, uh, because you 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 it's going to attract you if you use something like as simple as sort of a companion planting with marigolds, which is often torted. Uh, um, it, I find that yes, the it, the green fly, are, are, for an example, um, are attracted towards it, but the, they're attracted into the tunnel. It's attracting plants into the tunnel itself, so it's causing problems as much as anything else. But it's a beautiful system and it looks great. So um, part of that can be uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, you can't see the vegan organic picture, leave it. You can see it in the next slide. Um, so there you can see the vegan organic, um, very diverse. There's sweet corn there growing amongst um, squash. Um, there's bush tomatoes, cordon tomatoes, um, French beans, um, runner beans. Um, so yeah, um, a, a, it's a very attractive uh, and, and nice psychologically. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, this is just some of the produce at the end. So there's the tomatoes grown from outdoors. Roughly each of the 20 meter beds, 20 meters by one meter beds will yield around 45 to 50 kilo a bed um, of that kind of produce. I mean, um, and there you can see chilies, tomatoes, some grown veganically, some are, um, some are, some of within this basket are, are also this hydro in amongst that as well. Um, and there at the top, again, you can see a picture of one of the tunnels 
um, in veganic production. Um, so that's it. That's the end. Wow. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm just, uh, you've blown my mind with all the information and the resources and uh, just incredible what you're doing up there in an area where, like you said, you're supposed to only grow a limited range of crops or it's only good for improved grassland. You kind of uh, proved that wrong. Um, anyway, I think we've got, please put your questions in the Q&A. We've only got one question there uh, so far, so do not be shy. This is from Joe. Joe is asking, is there an equivalent to the forest research support tool in England? Is there an equivalent um, to the forest research support tool in England? Not that I, I've not looked into it. I'm sure there will be something though. You'd have to go onto the forestry website. Um, so yeah, they, I know they've separated them off recently, the two forestry sectors. So you'd have to go and have a look on the um, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. I mean, given what I said a minute ago, how you've, you've proved the sort of uh, all these great resource websites wrong, what, what has been the reaction from people who live around you or crofters who live around you to what you're doing? Has there been an interest in, in sort of trying to do something similar? Um, well, I, I, I think really what's... I, I, I think everything, a lot of what I've learned has come from people around me um, because they've used to use those models and the older generation know they used to grow a lot of diverse foods because it was more subsistence farming models. So really I've just taken that and adapted it and tried to move it forward with modern technologies um, just to allow you know what modern ideas and concepts can be incorporated into uh, older knowledge um and that you know that, that's created that's what's created the the model that we've got now mm, mm, mm. um so as uh, I, I, I think yeah people find good and bad in it um. <laughs> <laughs> right right yeah, I get that. Interesting. Okay, we've got some more questions popping up now. Um, oh, Lois missed the beginning of the talk. Um, Mark, can you just describe where you are located? She missed the beginning when you were saying where you are. Um, Orkney. We're on the, one of the North Isles in Orkney. Yeah, you're right at the very top. Westray is, is it the most Northern Ireland? It's... Um, yeah, pretty much. I think North Ronald says slightly pips it, but it's 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 uh, and it's certainly the most exposed to the west. That's another fascinating fascinating thing that things like weather spark can show you because of the way that low pressures move, which can also show uh, in terms of exposure. We, we've previously talked about as low pressures move and they come into contact with land, the way that the winds move round them um, increases, just like we talked about with shelter. So. With shelter belts, it's the same as land works. So unfortunately, West Ray's at the just above the mainland of Orkney. So as the wind comes round, it increases. So we're even more exposed here than than you would be on mainland Orkney. Or um, I know that the, the, the from all of the data that I've read, it, North Uist um, and South Uist would be very close in terms of their exposure, but they would be probably two of the most exposed areas, along with some of the outlying areas of Shetland. Um, but only the outlying, the interior land would be nowhere near as exposed um, because of the way that the, the, the wind slows down as it moves across the land. Um, mm, so yeah, yeah, it's fascinating to, to, to be challenged by, because um, I think you've always got growing restraints so here, one of the big, you've got multiple growing restraints. So if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Yeah, exactly. It makes what you're doing even more incredible. And I, it was interesting what you said about the bioclimes and being sort of on a level sort of with Alaska in, in those terms. That's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, let me see. Alaska, rather than Alaska, Unalaska, you should, yeah, it, which is oh, further okay. up. It's an island. Chain. It's another island chain that has similar amounts of exposure, and um, that's just north of Alaska. There's a group of islands. It's a 
another very beautiful but but very windswept <laughs> marginalized <laughs> line. Yeah, we complain about our weather in Aberdeenshire, but honestly, I'm not going to complain ever again. <laughs> uh, let me see, we've got a couple of other questions here. Um, somebody asked, why is hydroponic not veganic? Um, well, it's debate. It's entirely debatable. I just wouldn't call it that because I think to to be if you're using the word vegan, um, you're using it in terms of uh, a much higher uh, ethical. Uh, can I use the word standard? I don't know if I can. Anyway, uh, 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 it's it's much more ethically inclined. Um, so therefore, I don't think that if you're extracting minerals. Um, from the earth with giant amounts of machinery and then shipping it around the world that has to be considered um, uh, not that sustainable if you if you're a uh, my models are nature farming based so for me it's it's just not uh, it's not that sustainable um, I have to make compromises because some of my, uh, some of how I grow is about um, making a living um, so there must I have to make compromises, but but in other areas of my own production, um, which is pure, where I have total control, um, it's 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 all influenced by um, Japanese nature farming models. So, but you yeah. could debate the area of 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 it being, uh, but I think you'd be on very difficult ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Another question here from Monica. We heard you talking about your maximum temperatures in the summer. Monica says, what is your minimum temperature up there? Minimum temperatures for winter. So that if, if your minimum temperature, you would rarely go into minuses. Um, wow. you, you, so that, that can actually be of benefit. Um, you know, that can be of some benefit, uh, to, but the wind, chill factor like the wind chill factor today so your temperatures today are, i think it's around eight degrees something like that you're um eight to ten degrees but your wind chills factor is two um so we can be at two to three degrees with a wind chill factor of minus seven um, and Oof. that's where, you, where your problems can come in um but it is a bit more temperate it doesn't really get yeah. that cold but it doesn't really get that warm um, but then that's, you know, there's probably 15 degrees in it, which is enough. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it doesn't get that warm in summer, which can be problematic to things like French beans that ordinarily you wouldn't grow in temperatures less than around 20 degrees. Um, but obviously, once you've created the um, shelter, you're getting you're getting an increase in, in temperatures. Right, right. Got it. Yeah. Um... Got a question here from Wendy. Wendy says, great talk, so interesting. Have you considered growing any what would be considered wild foods or wild relatives of modern vegetables? Generally, they need less inputs and are more healthy. Um, well, we, we that's another area entirely, you see, because uh, that, it, um, there's no pictures up now, but at the very back of where we are, um, we grow... Um, uh, I don't like the all landscape to me is wild so I can't use the word I can't make a separate all, everything's wild to me um, so even urban spaces have their own sense of wilderness um, so that in these spaces uh, in other spaces that we have we have hectare areas that are um, have got a lot of uh, wild and native um, medicinal uh, fruit bearing and vegetable producing you know, wild angelica, sweet Sicily, um, uh, borage, um, wild garlics, ramsoms, um, raspberries, chokeberries, um, and all of these. You see, they're just they're they're left in a system that doesn't have my input at all. Um, you know, so everything can get on with its own. Um, apart from when I go in and take a few of the black currants that I can fight my way from from the birds. <laughs> So yeah, we do we do that as well in a separate area. Right, and and you've planted those things as opposed to them just occurring occurring naturally, have you? Or 
some of them are occurring naturally. Um, some of them I collect wildflower seeds and wild plant seeds. Some of them I'm taking as a model from some of the really old. What I tend to find is that if I go to the to the houses that have um, been left, that they're no longer inhabited, there's mm. lovely old gardens, um, you know, that are abandoned, and all of those all uh, they all have a, a story, and that story is 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 in their seeds. So I collect from that, and I rebuild those gardens. Hence, Sweet Sicily. Um, Sweet Sicily is growing all over in these abandoned gardens, and it was probably used as it, it, alongside rhubarb, um, you know, to take the acidity out of it um angelica's there um as well garden angelica and angelica um arc, arc angelica um so the um the non-native one that's obviously come down from norway or from um the pharaohs um that way on um so yeah they're both in the both in the outdoor spaces um and a lot of plants that are, uh, 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 are not medicinal or but they're just n natives and naturals they're all everything's welcome i don't really exclude anything because it's not native um if it if it finds a, a good place to be then that's that's great it's welcome um oh, fascinating i love the idea of collecting seeds from the gardens of abandoned houses that's great <laughs> Um, jo has another question. Uh, she says, I missed the beginning too. What prompted you to be farming where you are? Was it for the challenge? Uh, yeah, in some ways it was also to, to, to the, um, sometimes, uh, it's hard economically life can be sometimes. And so sometimes you've, you the you can only you you there's only opportunities um where you can make an opportunity you could dream forever to to find a a, a paradise but sometimes you've just got to make it so sometimes you have to just overcome things so back to the title overcoming difficulties of all kinds of difficulties whether they're economic or climactic <laughs> that's what brought me this far oh fantastic <laughs> fantastic and uh, let me see what else um rob is asking or perennial veg i think he's probably talking about you know adding on to wendy's question maybe about the wild um the wild species and you've mentioned some perennial veg in there haven't you so did you want to comment on the perennial yeah, yeah. veg yeah Mm -hmm. Well, only in the fact that they're obviously great for doing lazy beds, um, um, because then there's, once they're established, there's very little work. Um, strawberries need clearing out every now and again um, to rejuvenate them. Um, we've got asparagus in there. Um, we almost are using the kales as a kind of perennial in a different kind of way. Um, so, yeah, um, we grow lots of different types of perennial crops. Um, both in the beds and in the um, uh, less human inputted areas. Great, thank you. Um, Joe has added to uh, the question about hydroponics and why it's not uh, vegan. She says hydroponics often uses bread nematodes so as well as all the ethical issues with being being intensive it's not vegan is joe's comment on that um, yeah so they're exploiting um they're exploiting organisms and utilizing them for their own ends again it's it's a yeah it's a it's a it's a form of another form of entrapment i suppose an enslavement of um different species so yeah it's a, a very problematic one hydroponics can be but there is an element of sustainability to it so it, it becomes it becomes problematic that's why um you know i think everybody who any form of uh gardening farming becomes a form of proactive um um uh Oh, I had it a minute ago. Activism. So gardening and farming is a proactive activism. Um, I think it's really important if people have got something to say, they say it in the land. Um, there's no violence there and all you do is create beauty for all things. So it, nothing but benefit can come from it. Wow. I love that. I love that. Thank you. I think 
and I don't see any more questions in there. So unless anybody has another one, um, well, I'd just like to thank you. Oh, sorry, we've got another question. Just, but I'm not not as good as Sam at doing this. But um, so Joe says, ask, um, one beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. That's right. Um, so when I, when I visited, uh, you said you had uh, recently got 20 hectares. I was wondering if anybody wants to share what your plans were for expanding the crofts in the future. Um, well, sadly, we've been shut down. Um, they, uh, nobody wants to fund it. Um, oh, I only really? found out. Sorry yeah, to hear that. That's, yeah, it's a bit of a sore point, that. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh that's that. disappointing. Mm. Oh, it is a bit disappointing yeah. but you just have to take it it's just what it is it's where we're at currently um but you know you you do what you can do uh and uh keep going mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you thank you so much mark i really uh really appreciate your talk tonight so much to think about i've taken loads of notes and uh, everybody the recording will be up from tomorrow at the same link actually i should pop up my wee slide now shouldn't I um here it is is that yeah if everybody can see that at the link stockfreefarming.org beyond the possible um the link to Mark's recording will be up there tomorrow and I want to let you all know that Mark we're very happy that Mark is a member of our stock free advisory team so you know if anybody wants to send on questions to Mark have a phone chat with Mark uh, or even a Zoom chat with Mark, um, please get in touch. You can get in touch at contact at stockfreefarming.org or you can message me, Rebecca, at stockfreefarming.org. This is a free service to you. Uh, we've, we've got a grant to, to fund Mark to do that. So don't hesitate if uh, you have questions or you'd like some advice. I think there's just a wealth of knowledge and experience and uh, trial and error there that we can all benefit from. Um, so get in touch if you'd like to sort of engage Mark's services with that. Uh, and our website is stockfreefarming.org. Um, next week, we've got some exciting things going on. On Tuesday, we've got a talk about hemp growing and uh, creating a market for products from hemp. That's on Tuesday with Alison and John Eason. And then on Thursday, we've got Ian Tolhurst talking about uh, natural methods of pest control and self-sufficient soil fertility, all the things that Mark's doing up there in Orkney. So uh, another perspective on that um, from Mark, So uh, sorry, from Ian. So we hope you will join us next week. You can sign up at the link, register at the link, beyond the possible, stockfreefarming.org slash beyond the possible, if you haven't registered. And uh, once again, thank you so much, everybody, uh, for coming to the web webinar tonight. And uh, thanks hugely to Mark for what you've uh, shared with us and contributed tonight. And uh, hope to see you all next week. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye.